Hello, just to confirm one last time that I'm visible and audible. Yep, you are. Perfect. Uh, again, verbal POIs. I'll start my speech in three, two, one. A doctrine of fairness is a doctrine of truth. We propose framing three parts. Firstly, what does the doctrine look like? It looks like having a diverse amount of opinions with equal airtime, whilst abiding by other current media standards. These look like media needs to get political candidates of all sides during debates. It looks like interviewing people representing different opinions or using media of different perspectives. Obviously, fact-checking exists on both sides of the house, meaning that this debate isn't about factual information, but about opinion representation. Secondly, this policy will be moderated by the FCC and other legal bodies. This means that it will be accountable because it will go through democratic check and balances and are subjected to high degrees of scrutiny by other media outlets and lawmakers. The implementation involves, one, in creating a framework that outlines three to five major perspectives per issue that needs to be reported. This is sufficient because most issues are narrowed down to a few main camps of solutions anyways. For example, the refugee crisis can be narrowed down into two main solutions, opening or tightening border controls for refugees. This also could look like laxing or adding restrictions as the two main solutions to gun control. Second part of implementation is that we will find and take legal actions against channels that fail to implement the doctrine. Thirdly, we think that we will also have an appeal system that can be implemented for certain viewpoints to be implemented retroactively. Third part of framing, presumably, this debate is about controversial issues insofar as it occupies the majority of news headlines and causes the most amount of controversies. We have three arguments to bring to you in this debate. Firstly, why we fulfill the role of media companies. Secondly, why we increase discourse and change human interaction. And thirdly, Sophia and DPM will tell you why we uphold democracy. But now into first arguments and five layers under why we were able to fulfill the role of media companies. First line. Media corporations in this debate definitionally have a large audience reach. This means the scale of your audience is larger than other media outlets. Therefore, the extent of influence you have and the negative ramifications you cause through unnuanced information is much higher. Secondly, the media with significant audience reach have a reciprocal obligation to optimize informational access. Given that they exist, exist successfully today due to public Fine. and state talking, there's a responsibility to provide a variety of information, means that they internalize the information that corresponds best with the view, world's viewpoints and lived experiences. Thirdly, media corporations are unique actors that people turn to for information because people expect news to be trustworthy. This means that news corporations nurture political identity and choice because their, their information influences individual choice and preference, especially given how frequently people interact with the news. This looks like if someone is not given the information about how vaccines are made or the real dangers of COVID, their opinions formed on COVID is probably skeptical, hence illegitimate. This is important in two folds. One, information is a prerequisite for a functioning democracy. Without information, people's capacity to exercise their choice significantly diminishes. Secondly, choice is a reflection of self-identity. Being able to choose amongst ideas and find out the one that best suits you is the role of the state. But now to the fourth part of this argument. Crucially, News media and the status quo deprives you of choice, meaning that the fairness doctrine is an important mechanism to counteract the lack of choice. News media creates a deprivation of choice in three major ways. Firstly, profit incentivized news corporations means that they deploy sensationalist tactics to suck you in and continuously watch the news. This means once you opt in, you stay subscribed to the same channel and thus have limited access to alternate information. Secondly, news companies have perverse incentives to compete against other channels. This means that they, out, they will actively demonize other outlets and discourage viewers from switching channels. Third, this form of coercion is long-term because children are born into families with specific ideological leanings. Fifth part of this argument, how does the Fairness Doctrine help media companies fulfill their role? Fairness Doctrine man mandates an equal and equitable portrayal of the, both sides, which means that consumers have access to differing viewpoints that are not misconstrued. This means that as long as we propose more viewpoints on site proposition, we fulfill this principle or government uh, argument. Point. This looks like in places where there's more biased ide ideological leanings, media corporations are responsible for representing the other political camp. Therefore, this just means that we increase exposure and acknowledgement of the other side's ideals, meaning that we're able better, better able to help individuals construct their own opinions. The implication of this argument is, regardless of the fairness doctrine's practical outcomes, access to information is a principled right, given that it helps individuals know how to act on a day-to-day -day and maximize the choice to exercise. But before I move on, I'll take your point.
Why do governments have it in their best interest to not abuse the media sphere and turn this into media censorship? Firstly, we told you already that media censorship is highly unlikely because there's a significant amount of backlash that will happen. Media outlets, if they are shut down for no reason, will most likely go out and protest. Individuals will most likely to protest, right? This debate probably happens in the sphere where there is actually democracy, right? Otherwise, this debate just doesn't exist. Hence, therefore, the amount of backlash you'll receive as a government for trying to censor material and just do not have a perfect justification means that it is too high of a risk for governments, any government to take. And even if they do take the risk, it is highly likely that it will have significant consequences. But now to argument two, which is why we increase discourse and change human interactions. The thesis of this argument is the implementation of the Furness Doctrine counteracts existing polarization and creates less toxic discourse. Three layers. Firstly, how is the news worsening polarization? Three reasons. One, in the age of social media, news organizations have to stand out from a sea of information. They have no choice but to sensationalize news and use clickbait titles to attract views and maintain ad revenue. This results in newsroom, newsroom editors intentionally spreading misinformation to appeal to certain demographic biases, such as poor people are lazy or immigrants are dangerous. Secondly, the rise of populism around the world post-Trump means that politicians default to mudslinging and demonizing as the most convenient political strategy to gain votes. This new sensationalization feeds into society's political division and churches legislative gridlock. Third reason, media corporations have incentive to maintain existing viewer bases. Changing political leanings may cause viewers to turn to other channels. Hence, they have an incentive to not address multiple perspectives and continue to maintain their existing viewer base. Layer two, why does the fairness doctrine solve? Two reasons. One, we force news organizations to compete with each other by providing continuous subsets. Organizations that can address the best form of opposing arguments will most likely gain the most credibility than the ones that address the shallow version of the same view. This is unique because to the fairness doctrine, Point. because news corporations now compete to represent the variety of viewpoints. And better, whereas on opposition, different news media engage with non-overlapping perspectives, appeal to different audiences. Hence, there is no competition at all on side opposition. Second reason, this raises awareness on what these issue, other issues are, right? Prompting discourse on news channels and interviews, as well as prompting individuals to do more research on their own about these issues. So what is the impact there through? Two impacts. One, we decrease echo chambers. Echo chambers are hard to form on our side because each topic are exposed to different viewpoints. It forces individuals to engage with opposing views where they were not previously aware before. Tangibly, when we reduce echo chambers with demeaning views on minorities, minorities also feel more comfortable speaking out about their experiences in open discourse. Furthermore, echo chambers thrive on government conspiracies, they are being signs for speaking the truth. When they are given the sufficient platform, it undercuts their conspiracy theory, and they have to gain legitimacy through proper reasoning. Now to the second impact on democracy. People are now making independent decisions instead of voting based on biased information presented by news media corporations. If people make independent rational choices on what is best for them, then it will most likely be more accurate in terms of democratic representation. Even in one party states, you are increasing nuance and discourse within the parties themselves because their constituents are introduced to views beyond the party line. Furthermore, when people are later experiencing the consequences of policies that they illegitimately support, then there is a lack of confidence in the state, which encourages counterproductive trends such as decreasing political participation. It also looks like an apathy towards government policies or encouraging governments to further intervene in common life. With all of that, we are so proud to propose. Great, I thank the speaker for that very fine speech. Calling upon Elo, here, here. I'll just take like 20 seconds to wrap up my speech. Um, get my papers in order. Am I audible and visible? Yep, you are. Okay. Um, I'll take POIs through chat. Please don't unmute yourself at any point of my speech. I'll start in three, two. 
The fairness doctrine is not fair. It is one that governments can abuse to consolidate power and it leads to reduced discussion of important issues. What do we support? We broadly support the status quo. Specifically, we want three things. One, an independent regulatory body that punishes intentional misinformation, such as the FCC in the US and Ofcom in the UK. Second, instances of unintentional misinformation need to be addressed in a future broadcast once the error has been identified. And finally, enforcement of antitrust legislation to prevent media consolidation. Before I move on, I'll deal with the responses, right? Recognize the first thing that we get from proposition is that they talk about their model, right? Where they're going to have the regulatory bodies going to be something like the FCC and other legal bodies are going to hold them in check. Who elects who stays on this regulatory body? Who is this a democratic process? If not, then presumably the government does that, right? Presumably the government is going to decide who sits on this regulatory body, which means they have an active incentive to ensure that these are people who are going to support them, who are going to ensure that the government isn't being criticized and questioned in the first place, right? We think that this gives a leverage to the government to manipulate what kind of in, what kind of news is being propagated. They had to make it clear why that doesn't happen on their side, right? But recognize what we get from their side. They talk about how choice is important. Panel, this isn't a debate about whether or not choice is being restricted. Choice is literally once one click away. You can go to a different news channel and you can just click and read up what they're saying, right? This is not about choice. This is about how people aren't this like this debate is about how people aren't actively trying to like take up uh, to like use that choice. Right. We don't think that is a relevant that is a relevant argument in this debate. Right. But secondly, they talk about how like uh, but secondly, they talk about how like media corporations in general propagate very, very like false news and very like uh, news that is aligned with one side. We think this is we think we think this is not true because recognized media houses in general have an incentive to propagate news that is, that is not, you know, very extreme or very like uh, aligned to one side, right? Because recognize corporations provide ad money, which is how media houses run, right? We think that they still need this money to function. We think that on their side, this does not happen because corporations do not want to associate with media houses that are blatantly so, uh, that are blatantly so, you know, uh, like positive towards one side. We think that because of PR, these corporations don't necessarily do that. But before I move on, I'll take a POI if there is one. How is the regulatory body on your state house not biased as well, given that you want to use the same actor on site proposition? On our side, at least these media companies have the ability to come up and say what they want, right? We think there's the independence of the press that exists on our side that doesn't exist on your side. That is the comparative. Moving on to the first argument, then, this policy hinders a free and fair democratic process. Freedom of press is absolutely essential for any democracy to function. And this largely deals with the POI, right? Because recognize it provides us information on the government and its actions that people need to decide. Without it, people are unable to make an informed decision about how to vote, which party to support, etc. In the status quo, the press is only interfered with under very strict conditions, such as one, limiting misinformation, lies or slander, or second, like banning direct incitement of violence. In both of these cases, the rules are objective. A fake story is objectively untrue. And incitement is when you have directly caused an objective risk to a person or a group. However, in Proposition's world, whether a network is covering a controversial issue sufficiently is very, very subjective. What is sufficient coverage and which viewpoints need to be covered are all subjective. What are the potential consequences of this? First, for any political party, it is always advantageous to suppress media platforms that challenge them or support oppositional viewpoints. In Proposition's world, they are likely to use whatever powers they have to appoint members in this regulatory body in a way that benefits themselves. This also deals with the prime minister's response that in a democracy, media censorship is not likely. because. Even in the best liberal democracies, po politicians clearly have this incentive. Even in the US, where commissioners of the FCC are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, the FCC used the fairness doctrine to force the Washington Post to reduce coverage of the Watergate scandal during the Nixon administration. It is something they need to defend. But it's far worse in weaker democracies like India, Poland, Hungary, or Brazil. They can keep suing news companies for alleged breaches and cause them a huge amount of time and money. These lawsuits are intended to censor, intimidate, and even silence political dissent from news corporations. This is their comparative. This is why they're worse. These are also hard to hold to account since public often don't care or understand the details of legal disputes over regulation, right? All of this has uh, this has all like enabled simply because of all of this is like enabled simply because of how subjective the standards of fair representation of all viewpoints is, right? But even if I take government at their best, even if proposition somehow has the best regulators and there is no room for abuse, they still need to make a highly subjective judgment with limited budgets, which will lead to errors. This means 
when prioritizing the allocation of resources, they will avoid prosecuting the large broadcasters against whom legal battles are more difficult to win. Smaller news corporations on their side will be targeted in an arbitrary and discriminatory way with, who will be like driven out of the industry due to costly legal battles they cannot fight. The industry will be monopolized even further. At the end of the argument, it's evident that politicians can use this policy to hinder a free and fair democratic process, even in proposition's best case. On to the second argument then, about how controversial issues have reduced coverage in their world. Unlike the COVID-19 or Russian invasion of Ukraine, there are a series of issues that are important, but are not immediately apparent to an audience. Thus, the broadcaster has discretion over whether to cover it. In proposition's world, these issues get covered a lot less for two structural reasons. One, logistics reasons. It takes far more resources to analyze an opposing viewpoint in a broadcast. For example, complex nuances of a climate bill now need top experts on their side to discuss both sides. As a news broadcaster, in fear of prosecution by the regulatory body, you avoid covering the issue altogether. You know this issue is not immediately interesting enough for your audience, so they don't necessarily like tune out because you aren't covering it. And secondly, for ideological reasons, the most ideologically rigid me media organization know that they will lose viewers when they discuss the opposing side to certain controversial issues. For example, when Fox News avoid would avoid like covering the later stages of Bush's war on Iraq, just because re recognize that even though these later stages weren't so central that viewers expected coverage on them, reporting on this could potentially turn off your audience, right? This harm, this like the harm of all of this is that you lose out on opinions about controversial topics important to decision making, all because media corporations fear the fairness doctrine. Furthermore, we argue that it is untrue that presenting both sides of the story is always good. This is a direct response to their argument, right? Because recognize first, some of the best journalism in the history of the profession were one-sided biting critiques of specific powerful actors like the Watergate reports on Nixon administration or like the Boston Globe's reports on sex abuse in the U.S. Catholic Church. The core of the government's case in he here is that, like, they they get is that like they get a better informed society. This policy, despite its intent, leads to the opposite occurring. But second, two debates, two sides of a debate, do not always deserve equal coverage, right? On their side, airing both sides on these kinds of issues is dangerous. Think about COVID nineteen vaccines. Anti vax proponents who are invited on proposition side can be very persuasive speakers, use misleading facts that are hard to like rebut in real time and therefore be convincing despite lack of evidence. This literally costs lives. Think about minority issues in like in in, in like countries, right? Think about how them not receiving th think about how like how presenting both sides is essentially going to come back and cause literally harms to human dignity, right? This is something side opposition refuses to stand for. On our side, most news corporations naturally refrain from representing the side that is dangerous or immoral. This is because most broadcasters earn their revenue from advertisers, particularly large corporations who do not want their brand to be associated with a network that is so supportive of what's dangerous or actively can be seen as costing people their lives. For all these reasons, we think that news corporations have an incentive on our side to not uh, on, on our side to remain uh, to remain better, we oppose. I thank that speaker for that very fine speech. Calling upon DPM here, here. Um, hi, am I audible? Yep, you are. Okay, thank you. Just give me a second.
I'm incredulous that the fact that our principle of a choice was brushed off by saying that viewers can just be a click away from getting other views. We gave you structural reasons as to why there are incentives for companies to brainwash their viewers and say exactly why and put them down a path of sensationalization. None of this was engaged with, and because of this, our principle of choice still stands, and I'm going to prove to you why further on this is round winning. I have a few things I'm going to do in this debate. First, let's talk about government obligation and government abuse. Second, we talk about why exactly choice will be will be restricted on their side of the house. And then lastly, talk about why we get better discussion on issues in and of itself. So first, then on government obligation. I think the first thing that they say underneath this is that governments are abusive and that regulations will be a gross misuse of power in the status quo. I have a few responses to that. There are a few reasons why this won't be as abusive or why it won't be abusive at all, right? So firstly, on the civil service branch, the FCC is a natural civil service industry in the sense that Democrats picked it and legislated it to approve it. So there are checks and balances. So FCC has been doing this for decades. They care about transparency and are likely to make the best decisions given that you already operate using the FCC and the status quo. But secondly, there's immense scrutiny, right? And I think that the, you cannot underline, you cannot underscore this enough. When there is immense scrutiny to judge how many people are going to how many people are going to view or what can be broadcasted or not, there's literally going to be a lot of whistleblowing, a lot of pushback against if there are wrong decisions being made. You're literally the ones who are restricting news corporations. If you do the wrong step or if you do something that is miscalculated, they will call you out in of itself, right? Companies that can call the government every day do this already, right? They can fight back because these are large corporations and that's exactly why if the government missteps or overdoes something, then they're going to be the calling them out, calling them abused and corrupted in and of itself. That's probably something that the government wants to avoid regardless of who's in power, right? But secondly, we think that FCC also has a lot of mental uh, transparency maintained. And this is that they want to see that there's something unpoliticized. They want to see something that's good because if they overset their boundaries, then the public is going to lose trust in them. And that's something that they don't want. But lastly, then cross comparison or call it can exist on our side house. So if the government shuts down a viewpoint on one source, individuals from all groups can now point that out and cross compare with different news sources as to what exactly has been left out and fill in the blanks by themselves. So it's actually very easy to point out what the government has done and why exactly that is so bad. And that's why you just don't get this massive overuse of power on their side house. But lastly, I just want to flip this point. I want to say that if the government government on their side is so perverse and has such bad incentives, there are much worse ways they can do that on their side. In the sense of when officials can do a backdoor briberies or say, if you produce this, which is already happening in the status quo, if you give, if you produce this or if you have a storyline, we can give you a lot of money for that. It's a lot easier, to, it's a lot harder to call it out on their side of the house when these are behind doors and there's no regulation in place to actually give equal time to over issues and therefore there can be a disproportionate skew on both sides. So I've taken down why exactly the government, because of immense scrutiny and because of cross comparison, yeah, they do not overstep their boundaries. And why exactly, if they want to rely on regulations, they cannot rely on the fact that government abuse will be so rampant on their house. But then secondly then, I want to bring back the point about choice and tell why exactly it's so important in this debate. Their whole obligation, their whole response was one click away is literally is one click away is already happening and people have this choice already. But that misses our nuance, right? We told you a few things like sensationalization and demonization about the other side, even if it's not extreme, which is their mitigation that these are going to be mitigatory views, they can still be selectively skewed and tilted. This is a nuance that they miss in the sense that it's profitable for these companies because so long as they have a loyal viewer base, they don't really care about who exactly they're misconstruing and misrepresenting. That's why profit still flows in because advertisers don't care who the voter base is or who the viewer base is, so long as you have a constant and steady large majority base of viewers, then it's okay, A-OK -okay for them, and they'll still fund you anyways. So that's exactly why they're putting up funding, or why is it they have an incentive to be modernized or moderate, just simply doesn't work. Point. They have a loyal fan base, and that's exactly why they get more radicalized and more sensationalized on their side. But lastly, executives can make political decisions that limit choice, right? So even if you don't want to be, you want to be a moderate, there still are executives at the top who can make these decisions for you, and it's just that they have their own biases, they have their own political views, and that's why exactly choice will be restricted when the people who who are viewing this thing that is unbiased, but actually it's been gone through a lot of filtering and politicization on their side house. So the last conclusion of Point. this is that choice to choose is very, very limited on their side house. And even if there are clicks away, people do not click on it to begin with because of the incentive structure of these companies. And that's why the government has an obligation to fix this. But then moving on that, why exactly do you avoid, why, why you don't avoid covering issues? Their whole point underneath this was you lose massive amounts of funding when you have to go to other sources and thereby you cover less things, lots of these controversial issues in general. A few responses this. I think that firstly on funding, they just asserted that it would be a burden or a hinder, right? If these are large multinational corporations who have millions of people tuning in each day, I'm still very unclear why exactly they will lose massive amounts of funding if they have to go through a little bit more viewpoints or have to do more interviews. Likely they can cushion these things in of itself. But secondly, large companies probably have the most incentive to cut back on other miscellaneous things like gossip sections, like other celebrity news stories, and they can redirect money into being more efficient there. So we flip this claim and so that even if they have to lose corporate, even if they have to lose money, they would still put 
put these more money onto better things and make it more efficient in and of itself. But secondly, these corporations still have an incentive to report on diverse issues, right? And for this mechanism, because when you have to report on the same things, you need other ways to differentiate themselves, right? People still want to know about national controversial issues because they still apply to them. That's why news corporations will still report on them because they have the most influence and most ability to make a statement. That's why on their side house, you actually get less reporting on diverse issues when they can only resort on help on, on reporting on one sort of or one aspect of the issue. When everybody has to report on the same things, they get more diversification. We flip their point about why you avoid issues. That's what's happening on their side. Before we move on, I'll take your point. If all viewpoints deserve equal representation, then would you pit a Holocaust denier against a survivor of Auschwitz in the same debate? Right. Okay. Let's move on to my last point. Why not every? Why everything should be represented, or why the claim about not everything should be represented is simply untrue. I think, firstly, this is extremely subjective. You can cherry pick examples all you want. There are still a lot of unconventional issues that still have legitimacy, like abolishing prisons, like religious minority viewpoints. These are still things that deserve to be represented, even if they are smaller points. You cannot just collectively pick ones and say this is bad, right? But think that secondly, those based on false truths and misinformation are probably going to be filtered out, like in the status quo, and still being given consent to. So if the officer survivor doesn't want to be in this debate, then we wouldn't invite them on anyways, but there are probably many people who do want to engage in conversation, who do want to be represented on national television, and that's exactly why we give them a platform that you don't get on their side. But thirdly, at our worst case scenario, when we represent these viewpoints, we get more engagement, and you don't fester these bad ideologies in the corner, right? When you bring them to a national stage, and you get more awareness, attention on it, that's when you actually call it why it's problematic to begin with. This is an entire flip on their side, because on their side, these ideas, these ideas never get called out. On their side, we do bring them out to light, we do give them more of a national attention, and that's why they're more likely to be shut down, and and more like people to understand why exactly it's so bad when you engage them in conversation. Then lastly, moving on to my last extension about why you uphold democracy. I think besides having their own political agenda, existing news sources are biased against smaller parties and niche ideologies for two reasons. Firstly, a lack of public engagement where more people are aware of existing parties or large viewpoints and don't want to engage with those from minority, i.e. religious minorities or far left minorities for who are for abolishing prison. They're not small in numbers per se, but the majority has conflicting viewpoints and that's why they ignore them. But secondly, nepotism and advantages of, bi of being more mainstream also impact this. So bigger parties can buy up time on articles or news sources or TV segments to a much larger extent due to wealth and power, like Bezos and the Washington Post, Jobs in the Atlantic, and Benioff in the Time magazine. Bigger parties tend to have internal connections to the owners of news sources through similarities such as status, wealth, or business deals that reinforce news corporations to favor certain ideologies. Know that that is exactly why on their house, deals are much more corrupt and much less transparent. If they're not done through the government, they'll be done through the rich and the elite. Why is this so bad? So that firstly, this corrupts democratic principles. In a democracy, people are free to express their viewpoints and have them heard and responded to. When smaller parties are unfairly discriminated against by the media, they're disproportionately unable to express themselves and be engaged in the conversation. This really uh, clashes with their point about why you present wrong ideas. So even if they are wrong ideas, a portion of the, of, the, of the population still holds them, and thus we still deserve to represent them and have them engage in the conversation. This results in a few in a few things, right? Bigger political parties are unable to be called out, and people stand these viewpoints despite potentially liking another one better. Different viewpoints are being neglected and able to reach general society means that the minorities aren't catered to as well. So how do we solve this on our house? When we mandate means to give smaller parties or ideas a platform that is broadcast to main, mainstream society, it's easier to enter into the democratic conversation and not to be overshadows. We humanize the other groups more and they're less likely to buy into demonizing narratives and instead be more open to seeking middle ground compromises through politics, through policies, et cetera. For all these reasons, because we have to pro we protect the principle of choice, we're very proud to propose. Great, I thank that speaker for the very fine speech. Calling upon DLO, here, here. Hi, uh, before I start, confirming if I'm visible and audible. You are. Excellent. Um, once again, preferred pronouns he, him. I'll take POIs through the chat if you have one. That out of the way, I'll be starting shortly. Starting my speech in five, four, three, two, one. To win this debate, proposition needs to prove two things. First, why are the media houses in the status quo irredeemably bad? Two, how do they actually fix this issue if they are so bad? If we can disprove any one of these issues, we win this debate, but we'll do both in the two 
things that I'm going to discuss in my speech, one on abuse of power and two on actually improving the quality of information available. But before that, I want to frame out this whole weird principle that they have on choice in two ways. Number one, I want to notice that their entire choice, like if you think about it, if there's a store next to my house where I can go and buy Diet Pepsi, but I choose not to, their entire principle says that I'm committing an incredible moral harm. The simple reality of the status quo is that there are a numerous amount of media houses that are available. With the advent of the internet, you can choose with the click of a button to access any form of uh, news that you want. They say that news is coercive. Sure. But then what you're doing is equally coercive, right? Because then you're forcing other forms of media outlets to come there and express your opinions when you don't want it. Perhaps you're a liberal person who wants to be expressed to liberal ideologies. That's why you go to uh, news outlets like Jacobins. Why are you then forcing your ideas on them? Their entire principle backstabs on itself. But number two, even if you don't buy the initial premise and you do think that it is important that people are met with a variety of information, Basma gave you layers and layers of analysis as to why less news is going to be covered in the first place. Media outlets are unlikely to cover controversial issues. Media outlets are likely to self-censor themselves because of government abuse, which brings to my first point about government abuse. What do we tell you? We tell you that the media, media outlets place, uh, have an important role in our society in holding the government accountable and by calling out uh, instances of government abuse. We think that give, this gives the government more capacity to hamper down on media. What do they say? The first thing that they say is that this new board that they're going to make is going to be incredibly impartial. And the example that they give is because it's going to be elected by the Senate. Guys, the Senate is the most politicized institution currently in the United States. Their entire job is to hold the president accountable, and they don't because they didn't impeach Trump because the, the part because Senate is effectively like elected by Republicans, and it is incredibly politicized and is bipartisan. The simple reality is governments have an incentive to crack down on these media outlets, and now you give them the capacity to do so because you give them a legal right. You give them the ability to give these board. You, you get to, the government gets to decide who gets to be on this board, what policies are implemented by the board, how are these policies implemented. The likely counterfactual then is the government is going to crack down on dissenting voices that they don't like. How do they respond to this? They say that, ah, there's going to be massive backlash. No, this backlash is not going to be anywhere near symmetric for the simple reason that otherwise, if the government were to randomly like, lock up a journalist, there would be massive backlash because there's a visceral reaction to it. I saw the journalist getting arrested. Now, the government hits them with loads of regulation. The government hits them with loads of legal battles, which people are unlikely to notice. Notice, most people don't watch up on like legal, legal every single day. You don't read up on what goes on in Supreme Courts every single day. You are unlikely to notice them. Let's be charitable. Let's assume that these regulators are good. Here's why, even then, there's still going to be bad actors in two ways. Number one, how do you know when something is fair? Like, how do you know if two experts are equally skilled? If an idea is like underrepresented in society because they're advocated by a minority, is it really fair if you just give it more, uh, like the same amount of screen time, given that anywhere else they won't be represented? The likely counterfactual then is that their personal biases in, the, in this own regulatory body are going to come out and they're going to subjectively act out on this because uh, subjectively act out on this and, and then sky for media. Number two, they will selectively exercise this power. Given that this is going to be subjective, it is going to be probably very hard for you to actually win in court battles if they do exist. This means that media outlets are going to selectively exercise these powers on entries they can think they can win, i.e. relatively smaller media houses as opposed to corporations with billions of dollars in funding that can fight off your legal battle. Why is the comparative important? The comparative here is the only other instances where the government does actually intervene in the business of media are when you can objectively prove it. You can objectively prove that something is false via fake news. You can objectively prove that something is liable in, in a court of battle. You cannot prove that something is fair because of this degree of subjectivity. We win this debate simply on this clash independently because media is the only entity that can hold the government accountable. In the absence of this, government abuse, corruption, uh, human rights abuses, all of these things go unreported. This is simply enough to win this debate. Let's say we don't buy that. Let's say we need to prove why the quality of information is better. We prove in the first argument why states can use this to control the flow of information. We prove in the second argument why this causes fewer ideas to be discussed anyways. And I will prove in my third argument why people are drawn to alternative worst forms of media. But let's say you don't buy that either. I will now respond to this claim that media houses are impartial in four ways. But before that, go ahead. Okay, seeing none. No, it's not, uh, sorry. Four... If not for the FCC, who regulates these policies? Who regulates what news articles is deemed as fair or not fair? Exactly. Our counterfactual is that they shouldn't. Your literal model is that you have the government body regulating what news outlets people should and should not view. Even if these government bodies are good, we still gave you incentives where there's likely massive, massive capacity for abuse to occur in the first place. First response, we think that these uh, outlets have an incentive to be impartial due to three reasons. Number one, they get money from ad revenues. They get money from ad companies. And while these companies may care about the ratings of these media agencies, they also probably care about their own reputation. You would not want your company brand to be associated with a, uh, with, with a media outlet that is literally spreading false news and is causing people to die because of that. Number two, there's often cutthroat competition between other media outlets. If you don't cross the aisle and you show information that the most amount of people you could want, your own people could go away from your media outlets and go to somebody else. You presumably don't want that. Number three, you want to reach out to as many people as possible in order to maximize your revenue. 
Sure, media outlets could only show the ideologies of the far right or the far left, but by definition, there are re relatively few people actually on the far right, on the far left. Therefore, if you are to maximize your revenue, you have an incentive to cater to the center or the majority of people would actually want to believe it. All of this proves is that their policy is likely not going to be doing much for the simple reason that this is, uh, for the simple reason media outlets want to cater to it in the first place. Let's say that media outlets are biased anyways. The likely counterfactual then is that they're going to show this bias in the way that they actually implement it, uh, in the way they actually show both sides of the debate. This means that they're probably going to give tokenistic representation to all ideologies. What does this look like? It looks like showing someone who's really bad at explaining a particular viewpoint and an expert who's really weak at explaining an ideology. This happens all the time. Literally, Ben Shapiro goes around college campuses debating high school students at like college universities and calling them experts. Or it looks like you get the most extreme person from the other viewpoint to show that this is what their viewpoint looks like. Every single time you want to have a discussion about healthcare, Fox News gets the most dedicated communist in order to show that everyone who cares about uh, healthcare is actually a communist. What this does is it shows to people that, th that this ideology is really, really bad. They're really fringe. I should not believe into it anyways. So people are pulled away from those ideas. Let's say exposure is positive. Even then, it's going to uh, moderate very few amount of people. This is because if you are a Trump supporter and you actually watch Fox News and you saw Fox News being critical of Trump, your likely reaction isn't going to be to stop watching Fox News. It isn't going to be stop believing in Trump. You're going to stop watching Fox News altogether. You're going to be angry at Fox News, which is why you're going to get even more radicalized who are unlikely to then be, uh, feel that you are being moderated. Let's say this doesn't happen either. You are going to be moderated. Here's why even then showing all forms of viewpoints is something that is bad in society. We asked him at a POI, do you think that a Holocaust survivor should be given the same amount of viewpoint as someone who is a, as someone who is a Holocaust denier? We think that this is absolutely horrible for two structural reasons. Number one, in the instances of a pandemic, when there's a time-sensitive issue, every single time you want to have an anti-vax, every single time you want to have a conversation about vaccines, you need to have anti-vaxxers necessarily come in. You need to give them the, the credence. This frictionalizes the entire conversation because debates get stalled out. They're much longer, which means that you actually have a much more time lag when actually fixing the issue. But number two, you have to understand that some people might actually go onto the side of the anti-vaxxers. There's no guarantee that if their experts are actually good, that is your best case, then some people will inevitably be drawn towards anti-vaxxers, which means these issues never get fixed in the first place. Let's say this doesn't happen either. We then believe that people are likely to flood to worse forms of social media or worse forms of news consumption, i.e. from social media. Why does this happen? One, because your likely reaction to Fox News showing being critical of Trump is to not watch Fox News. So you go to other alternative forms of media like subreddits. But number two, people are in generally very critical of the government. This is because the government is often responsible for the 2008 financial crisis. So you're incredibly critical of the government. Now that the government controls the media, you are unlikely to then believe in the media. So you go to subreddits, you go to Facebook groups. These are significantly worse because one, there are no editorial bodies actually holding them to account. But number two, everyone can post anything there anonymously. There is no journalist you actually know, so you can't actually call them out on it. At the end of this debate, we tell you that the government are going to heavily misuse this. Even if they don't, media outlets will never do this properly. And even if they do, we think that people are just going to go to worse forms of media. All of their harms are significantly amplified under their side. We are so, so proud to oppose. Great. I thank the speaker for the very fine speech. Calling upon Gov Whip here. Sorry, I'm going to quickly get my laptop charged. Got it. Sorry. Hi, am I audible and visible? If you are. I want to talk about two clashes. Firstly, what it is between the government or tycoons filtering media and which one is better. Secondly, about which side has better discourse and news quality. But before that, I'll like to engage with a 30 second extension on extremism and why we force people to go into more radical news. I'd just like to know this clash is actually on our state house in order to win it. It's not contingent on us proving why we have decreased radicalism. It is about providing people a choice that they believe that they do deserve and also about increasing discourse. The claim we got from DLO was that if you have um extremist extremists and they go and they see that Fox News is being infiltrated with liberal values, they want to go to even worse sources. Couple responses to this. Response one, notice that a lot of these radicals have probably changed. The reason for this is they want to believe that they're unbiased. So if there's a fairness doctor in post and they suddenly switch your views, it probably also implies to themselves that they are being unbiased, they're being biased. So that's why they wouldn't want to switch. We also think they have ties to anchors as well. 
for example, a Fox viewer probably has ties to Tolkien Carlson. That's why they wouldn't switch to even worse extremist views. Response two, when you don't say opposition, that actually exaggerates the harm of these rat holes and what they could do. Because if news is moderate per the characterization under the status quo, I don't really see why this Fairness Doctrine would still be a tipping point, because on our state house, our policy is just an extension of status quo if it's so moderate as it could be claimed. But even if the radicals that do a lot of harm to society, we think there are already laws preventing that, for, exa for example, sedition laws or terrorist prevention laws that do mitigate the harm from opposition. Response to you. I think on their state house, even if there's harm, it probably is in circles of less influence because there aren't as many viewers. But even if there are a lot of viewers per the characterization, if we could regulate that on their state house. Fourthly, we don't need to prove why radicals are actually bad. All we need to prove is why our principal path to victory, in which we actually allow them more choice, is a better comparative. So even the people who are pushing radical, radicalism, we think that's a net good because you're able to also exercise your choice as well. I want to deal with our first question on government versus tycoons filtering media. Under this clash, I would like to deal with two things. Firstly, engage with our principal path have to victory and push it, and secondly, deal with the claim coming from opposition about government outreach. The first thing from say opposition was that on how new uh, governments are able to censor the media, and these news media, because they notice it, they'll also self-censor themselves as well. And what is controversial is largely subjective. A couple responses to this. I think firstly, I'll just like to know, in our model, we made it really clear what these issues will look like that of large significant importance. It looks like those that have large significant societal discussions or that do also care to referendums. But secondly, I'll just like to know, on state opposition, they use the same actor as well. So I don't really think like on their state house, if we're so biased, why their state house would be any better, they actually need to prove the comparative. So we actively gave you reasons why governments wouldn't really want to abuse. So we told you why the government is largely a civil service and it's not subjected by partisanship. We also told you on why you could also have called mechanisms and it is directly engages with the point about media self-censoring. The reason for this is we think that when people are more informed on our state house, news media they also have an active incentive to call out the governments if they're constantly being abused. We think governments they also have no direct incentive to also abuse the news corporation as well. This is my third response. This is for two reasons. Firstly, when you say those that are in the FCC, they probably go into news industry after the term in the FCC because they're probably experts in that field. So what happens then is that they actually want to care about their own reputation. So that's why they wouldn't really want to oppress these media because they'll be seen as being corrupt. But secondly, though, we think the role of news media is to dig up their own politicians. So if you have the FCC regulator that's being so corrupt, we think they also know that the news media might dig up their on for example, their scandals Point. and also the mistress and all these scandals. So that's why on their state house, politicians they don't, on our state house, politicians that have the active incentive not to be corrupt. The next thing that gives us on their state house, no thank you, is that objective risks. You can only like, also censor media when it's also perpetrated violence or lies and slander. Two responses. I think one, we're giving you objective risks on our state house. In which a lot of these news that's so biased on their state actually leads to active harms, for example, marginalization of minorities and also people being pulled into society. So we think on our state, we're actually just preventing the harm. Secondly, though, we think like value judgment on our state house is actually uh, value judgment on our state is actually being preserved as a net good for the principle. And the claim that gives us a for principle is that people they don't have like they could do, go to like different news channels and that's also a good thing. Couple responses. I think one, we give you active reason why people they aren't able to cross compare because they don't have the time. They're also determined on their family they're born into. That's why it's even worse from people that don't have active choice. But secondly, though, we also proven to you on why on their state house, it actually is even worse when people that can't democratize the choice that they actually get. Because the issue isn't, isn't intervention or no intervention. Intervention happens on both sides. One side opposition is directly by these tycoons or media corporations, for example, Mudrock or Fox News. So that's why on their state house, when you're able to only propose the like, support the principle then, individuals are able to make the choice because we actually told individuals that all these views are important. We don't have a CEO deciding that. But for that, sure. Do you think Brett Kavanaugh cares about his reputation when he's pushing forward conservative ideologies? We think firstly, like he's one of the exceptions. We think a lot of these news media corporations and also these um, governments, they actually do care. But secondly, even if they don't care, we think a lot of news media corporations and also the people will point it out. It's not as bad as you claim. Second question on whether the discourse and news quality. The first thing I give us is that you have less funding and resources. So that's why you want to focus on complex issues. A couple of responses. I think one, we're talking about big corporations under this motion. We still do have funding. Secondly, even that's not true, we can also focus on facts and fill in the gaps of discourse as well. You don't need to have a lot of opinions. We're able to let people at least know basic facts of everything. But thirdly, though, we think even if like we have less um resources to pour into a lot of views, at least individuals they know different sides of the issue, they can cross compare and understand these different issues as well. Next thing I give us is that presenting both sides of the issue is not good. For example, certain issues don't deserve equal coverage. For example, anti-vaxxers they pose an after harm to society. Cover responses. I think first, like not 
objectively, more people will actually believe in conspiracy theories. For example, the anti-vaxxer theory, when you think the more time you actually give to them, people also recognize that's something that you shouldn't buy into. When you understate your house, if you don't give them a platform, essentially what they will say is that it's a witch hunt against our views. So that's why you compare it to understate your house, it's far even worse. But secondly, though, we think even more people buy into conspiracy theories, that mindset also cuts both ways. Because a Fox News person might also be influenced by liberal values, but a person with liberal values may also be influenced by Fox News. So we think on the numbers game, it's not objectively true that more people will be influenced by the anti-vaxxer theories. Response three, even if that wasn't true and more people believe in conspiracy theories, I think Stan made it really clear to you why choice is still a, like, a legitimate principle and also an independent fact to the victory on our state house. The next thing I'll give us then is that media is impartial. Cover responses because of ad revenue and they have incentive to also maintain a steady stream of revenue. Cover responses, I think one, that is not true because Madrock, for example, by Fox, he has ties to the Republican Party and also conservative values. So that's right, because of ad revenue, he has an active incentive to make sure his profit incentive is actually maximize. That's not equivalent to preserving people's best interests and also giving the information that they actually need to offer in the democracy. Secondly, even if that was true, I mean it's actually impartial, wouldn't we make it just even better on the RCA? How do you have to weigh it on the comparative? Next thing the DLO gives us was on how news is largely going to be tokenistic on Earth State House, which you actually intentionally portrayed views incorrectly and there's an illusion of solvency. Cover responses. I think one, on Earth State House, we have active competition between a lot of these news sources. So if you intentionally portray a view wrong, we're able to also call it out and you'll get out competed in the media cycle. Two, we think people that actually want to hear the views correctly portrayed because they're confident, confident in their views and they want to hear it directly engaged with. So if it's not portrayed correctly, you will also want to speak out for a model, we'll be able to portray the most accurate view. But three, we think even if it's not true that people aren't able to call a lot of these like, news that's portrayed incorrectly, we think the audience gets sharper over time on our state house is unique benefit. And which on their side, people just get used to sensationalized views on our side, even if in the short term they aren't able to call out, we think it's a norm and we should be able to also achieve a benefit in the long term. But what did they respond to on site opposition? I'd like to know a couple of things because I think that have been largely dismissive of our case. Firstly, on the principle, we have told you why a problem is never media corporations basically means they self center and intervene on what views people are able to access to. We think people largely don't have the time to cross compare. It's also arbitrary whether they need to pour it into a family or whether they're conservative or not. We think on our state house, we're actually able to uphold your principle of choice. But secondly, though, we also told you in the second argument on why echo chambers also are going to be demolished on our state house and why we're also able in our third standard argument to get more smaller parties also have their views portrayed. Their deal just didn't respond to this for all these reasons i'm so proud to uh, propose i thank that speaker for the very fine speech calling up on to appear here Hi, Ray, sorry. Um, am I visible and audible? Yep, you are. Great, thank you. Um, I'll start in 10 seconds. Um, I'll, um, just like, so sorry, reminder, like, no perfect pronouns, and I'll take the yours in the chat. Starting my speech in three, two, one. From first proposition, we get a really idealistic world where they want to change every single thing that is wrong in the status quo, where they want to ma achieve massive utilitarian outcomes. By prop two, they realize that they could probably never prove that. So at the end of the day, what proposition's only strategy in this round is to hedge their, hedge their bet on maximizing choice. But the problem of only prioritizing choice in a round is that you never proved why choice is inherently important. Unless you show to the panel as to why your principle has a unique value, i.e. why this is a fundamentally good thing to do, your principle necessarily doesn't weigh against that much of the outcomes that we're talking about. 
Let's clarify something. Proposition had the burden to prove two things to justify the implementation of the fairness doctrine. First, that the problems in status quo can never be solved in any other way. And secondly, the fairness doctrine can in fact improve things by censoring outlets with significant audience outreach. Notice that they cannot only say that they maximize choice because ma maximizing choice unless it results in utilitarian outcomes does not hold any form of value. Insofar as we can disprove any one of those burdens and prove that they actually make things worse, we do have an edge. From opposition, therefore recognize. Our claims were pretty simple. First, that the fairness doctrine could be in fact used for abuse of power by the government. And secondly, that media coverage would in fact be worsened. So therefore I'm gonna structure my speech to answer these two questions. First, on the question of could the fairness doctrine be used for abuse of power by the government? Notice that the way in here is all of propositions arguments were predicated upon them proving that this media censorship would be done effectively and the policy would be implemented impartially. So if we can disprove that, all of their benefits fall. A common feature of both worlds is that politicians ranging from those in Western liberal democracies like the UK and the US to those in semi-democracies like Hungary and Brazil have an incentive to prolong their tenure and hold on to power. The deciding factor then becomes was the capacity for them to actually make materialize their ambitions. Prop suggested that the reason they have democratic checks and balances is because A, it's a democracy where this debate occurs. I have three observations here. Number one, democracy isn't a monolith, it's a spectrum. Here's where Basma's argument about talking about countries like Brazil, Poland, and Pakistan become really, really important. The ruling parties are getting new legal processes to limit media freedom, and that's exactly what happened in Hungary, where Videsh shut down oppositional parties by saying they weren't impartial. Proposition, their only claim there is even if these are semi-democracies, people have increased political participation. But no, you miss the nuance here where you literally give active ammunition to the ruling party to clamp down on oppositional coverage by literally saying that they're not being impartial enough. This is incredibly harmful because you allow them to consolidate power far, far more. Secondly, even in the US or UK, Basma explained to you that how the administration actually intervenes so much in media coverage like the Watergate scandal. Also look at other cases as to how gerrymandering allows them to legally manipulate constituents. What proposition does is legally codifies the capacity for these administrations to essentially abuse their power that has been given to them. What then is the comparative? Our world relies on objective data to punish outlets, i.e. if an outlet spreads misinformation, they can still be kept in check under our side of the house, relying on facts. Given that we do not rely on subjective perception of an entity as to what is fair or how much time should be given to an issue, you allow a terrible metric to overtake media freedom. Here's where Shire's unengaged material becomes really, really important. He explained to you that obviously there are differences between certain announcers on one particular opinion show. Insofar, even if it is true that you both of them are experts, presumably proposition under side proposition, people can never make a conclusive conclusion simply because you reach a deadlock. What then they do is rely on enigma or eccentrics of the speaker. Presumably then what side proposition does is push people to make terrible choices where they are essentially flocking towards people who might be on the fringes now. We told you that under our side of the house, media organizers, organizers can still liberalize. Their second claim was that there will be backlash because these are larger companies who own these media outlets. First, the government literally has legal defense and evidence that you're not doing enough. The nuance is this is a subjective perception. There is no way that the company thinks is fair, would be considered fair for a government that wants to come clamp down on you. Secondly, notice that how large outlets are often owned by the same organization, i.e. Comcast owns both liberal and conservative and outlets. This implies even if one outlet gets clamped down on, they recognize their other outlets will perform better. So they have no incentive to protest. And their third claim was this is a regulatory body. Take a step back panel and notice, this literally knives their argument. If their intuition is media outlets erode choice by for forcing down specific opinions on audience, why is it fair for one undemocratic regulator to do the same where they decide how much coverage a victim of gun violence gets, how much COVID vaccines are talked about? This is literally the same thing that they're doing, only resulting in worse outcomes. Second, we told you that given that these would be still selected by like say the government, the biases would, of the administration would seep into them. The comparative is one, we have international fact checkers. We have apolitical bodies who are not selected by the government. Propositions relies on government's whim, we do not. Therefore, there, this is the reason why they can never have impartial implementation. This proves that their impacts would never manifest. What was the comparative? We told you that media continues to liberalize over time because they want advertisers and funding. And more importantly, they have an incentive to garner more audience. 
this engages with Prop's claim that they always rely on certain demographics. No, they realize that there is a massive competition between outlets even in status quo, so you want to cater to centrists. This looks like central liberals and central conservatives, or even those who are agnostic. This means we have organic improvement of media, which even if it is time consuming, is far, far better than what you get on proposition, which is lead, literal media censorship and silencing of opposition. Media is the fourth pillar of the, of the state. Proposition takes a wrecking ball and demolishes that. Before I move on to the second question, I'll take a PY. Why is it justified to let Madrock of Fox News determine what news people determine to know and how do you solve on your side? Like, again, notice that the fact that Murdoch owns Fox, people still have the choice to watch Fox. I mean, it's unclear, it's probably untrue that someone forced them at their gunpoint and said that you only have to watch Fox. Here's where our response that if you want, you can switch to other outlets. It is really, really untrue that people are always coerced into watching only one specific outlet. That is just simply empirically untrue. Under the second question, under which side is media coverage better? This takes proposition at their best. We assume that this will be done well. I think there are therefore two subclasses under this. First on quality of information and spread. Pop's first claim is that they're that first, you do not get nuanced information. This is empirically untrue. News broadcasters recognize that if they're not detailed enough, if they're not extensive enough, they lose audience. Also, these outlets already have extensive reach, meaning more than the majority probably rely on their coverage anyway. And I actually think it probably does a good enough job. Their second claim was that this forces people to take wrong choices. There are two observations here. First, this is a contradiction because you curtail choice of media outlets to maximize choice of people. I'm unsure as to what is the way of the importance of choice of one entity over another. Insofar as you did not get any answer to this question from side proposition, this argument should not be credited. But second and more importantly, know this panel, we do not allow people to opt into slave contracts. We do not allow them to opt into harmless assaults. The reason is choice doesn't have a principal independent value. It's what your choice results in. So far, we have explained that choice that proposition provides would be skewed, would be manipulated, and be forced by the government. And more importantly, this literally hinders coverages and media freedom. Therefore, their choice does not translate to important grounds or important outcomes. That is why this argument is no longer relevant. More importantly, we told you that you can literally switch to other channels, find information on the internet, and interact with other people with opposing viewpoints. Their claim was you do not click. Answer why. If, the, if their claim is that people have a want to get all the information, we can probably counter a certain that say that the incentive exists anyway. Then the last claim was on competition of outlets. We told you that this will never happen insofar as no news has any, any distinct characteristics to set them apart from any other outlet. Insofar as that never happens, people have no objective criteria to determine which outlet is better. They become apathetic and agnostic of the entire political spectrum because they realize every single news outlet does literally the same. But what was the unique harm? We told you that you literally result in less coverage of controversial issues because people think I might get persecuted or I might not be doing enough. You also result this where minorities are literally targeted and scapegoated under their side of the house by media coverage where because sim simply because governments can allow you to do so. Incredibly proud to oppose. Great, I thank that speaker for the very fine speech. Uh, just a reminder, I mean, I guess all speeches are over, but like I all substantive speeches are over, but do keep the time, eight minutes, 15 seconds, four minutes, 15 seconds. Great, calling upon opt reply, here, here. Hi, uh, just confirming if I'm visible and audible. Excellent, um, starting shortly. Turn my speech in five, four, three, two, one. Two things I'm going to do with my reply speech. First, I'm going to weigh up the conflicting principles and compare them uh, in this debate. And second, I'm going to talk about actually improving the media sphere. Let's talk about principles. The principle that we saw from proposition is that they basically have choice and choice is good. The problem is people already have the choice. What they then diverge into is that, okay, they have the choice. They don't seek out the choice. And that's still a principle violation. Let's test out this principle. People have the option to change their middle name. They have the option to change their religion, but they don't. Probably because of familial obligations, you believe in your religion. Probably because you care a lot about your religion and there's a lot of family pressure not to do so. By their own principle, this would mean that you are brainwashed by your family to not change your, change your religion. Therefore, you ought to be forced to change your religion because that's the only way you can maximize your choice. Their principle doesn't make any sense. People already have the choice in the status quo. They have the option to seek out. We should allow that, that to happen as opposed to forcing a choice on them. Let's say you don't buy that. 
why is choice good? They just sort of asserted this throughout the entirety of the debate. Presumably, choice is good because it helps you make ra right rational choices. If this is the case, we are the only side in this debate that actually tells you why the incentives of the media are skewed in such a way that if you do pass this policy, things are just going to get far, far more perverse. Let's weigh this up with what we tell you, which is abuse of power. We think that governments are going to misuse this. The, the only mechanism that they have is that the FCC is going to do this well. They haven't done this well historically. We give you the example of Nixon and the Watergate. We think that government institutions in general don't tend to do a good job in implementing policies. They say that, ah, Brett Kavanaugh is an exception. Well, sure, I get Amy Barrett Cohen is an ex exception as well. Sure, I guess Clarence Thomas is an ex exception as well. The problem is when you have so many exceptions, we just need one exception to be the head of the FCC. At that point, they can misuse uh, this policy in order to stifle dissent. Even if the government regulation is good, though, we think it is still going to be bad for the for the reason that they don't for the reason that they don't actually engage with us. They need to make subjective calls as to what is fair and what isn't. Their own personal biases may actually seep out. They may selectively apply this policy to instances where they can actually win, meaning that they're only going to do lawsuits against smaller outlets who they know for a fact that they can win against, as opposed to behemoths like Fox News that have uh, billions of dollars in revenue that they can actually do this against them. Why does this independently win us this debate? Two reasons. One, we think that the media is the only entity who can hold the government accountable. All other entities of holding government accountable are incredibly politicized. The Supreme Court is elected by the president. Uh, the Senate is obviously elected on party lines. They are unlikely to go against party lines. The media outlets are the only ones who can do this. Number two, in the absence of this, Sahib tells us that political parties can use this to consolidate their power in the media sphere. They can shut down dissent. They can shut down every single hit piece on corruption, which means it gets far, far easier for people like Rajapaksha to get away with uh, stifling billions of dollars from Sri Lankan people. This is easily enough to win us this debate. The comparative here is simple. All other forms of government intervention are objective. You can objectively prove that something is a lie. You can objectively prove that something is viable. You can libel. You can objectively prove that something incited violence. You don't have that when there's a large degree of subjectivity. Let's say you don't think that principles are important in this debate, and you think that only the, the, what's important is improving the media sphere. We win this for four reasons. One, we tell you why medias have an incentive to be pulled towards the center. They care about their advertisers. They want to garner as many people as they want, and if they only cater to the fringes, there aren't enough people on the fringes to actually make your ends meet. They gave us the own, their own incentive for them, which is that other media outlets will call you out. Sure, but then they can call you out for being biased under your side of the aisle as well, on our side of the aisle as well, which means there's an even greater incentive to be not to be objective. Let's say, secondly, that they are, are biased, but then why would they actually portray the other side well? Why would Rupert Murdoch, on our, any side of the aisle, want to show like a pro-gun active, pro-regulation pro, pro gun activist fairly? They're likely to give the weakest, the weakest expert, or they're likely to show the most extreme viewpoint so that people are polarized, people opt into less into that side of the aisle, meaning rational choices happen less. Third point, even if it's even if it's shown well, we think that uh, it's likely to moderate very few amount of people. A Trump supporter, just because he sees Fox News criticizing Trump, isn't going to go against uh, go, go against Fox News. They're going to go uh, going going against Trump. They're going to go against Fox News. They're then likely to go into social media, which is far far worse because nobody is holding them accountable. They're completely anonymous, so all of their harm significantly amplify on their side of the aisle. I literally explained this in, in, in my speech. They had no engagement whatsoever. But lastly, I just think that some ideologies should not be portrayed at all. Every single time you want to talk about BLM under their side of the aisle, you need to have someone talk about white lives matter. You need to assume that some people might actually opt into the anti-vaxxers. If their experts are actually good, that is their best case that the representation is good. At the end of this debate, we are the only side that keeps the government in check. We are the only side that gives you the information you actually need. For all those reasons, oppose. Great. Uh, I thank that speaker for the very fine speech. Calling upon Dr. Bly here, here. At the end of the day, I'm very unclear as to what opposition thinks about choice. At first, they say that the government is forcing a choice down their throat and people have the ability to choose for themselves. But in their second speaker and third, they say that, oh, choice doesn't matter as long as they're a net utility good. But what exactly is it, right? Why not just regulate to the best ideas possible? Yeah, because like they said, it's extremely hard to determine what is good. And if the government cannot do it, why not just expose people to ideas and let them choose for themselves? This is the, pr the principle from the very beginning, right? That choice is already being limited, limited by the wealthy, limited by the corporations, limited by the elite. That it's time for the government to actually step in and put people back to a moderate point of viewpoint, which you can see both sides and determine clearly based on their own preferences. I'm going to do two things. First, about the principle and secondly, about the quality of news. But first, a bit of a clarification. Why are the current regulations just a massive knife and why do we not have to deal with it, right? I think if the FCC is so biased, they will find ways to make objective viewpoints subjective as well. In order for this debate to work, if they use regulations on their side of the house too, then FCC has to have some form of legitimacy, accountability in and of itself. We don't have to defend for a corrupt system or else this debate wouldn't happen in and of itself. So then moving on, what happened in this debate? For 
firstly, we talked about the principle, right? We told you how corporations have the incentive to solidify viewer base and through radicalism and bias, right? They can be seen as moderate to gain avenue. They can be seen as this, but they can be selectively biased because the people at the top can selectively fil filter things out. What did opposition say? They said that, oh, they're one click away. So choice is, and isn't actually limited. But secondly, that we are also infringing on choice. Note how we pointed out multiple times why this doesn't engage with the nuance of our case. We gave you nuance as to why it's not one click away. And when people are opting into this news source like Fox or BBC, they're going to go down or like a spiraling in terms of going to be more radical, going to like view the other side as lesser because of this polarization, because of this little forms of bias that can they can pick out. They can't really pick out because it's so small. And why we told you why people's choices are being expanded, not infringed by the government. I think it's very funny for them to say that government is shoving choices down their throat when we literally expose people to more and more choices as to what they can choose and let them choose for themselves, not being forced into one. Their whole response was to use intuition pumps, but this doesn't actually work, right? Like people with liberal views, they can still read on liberal views if they want. They can still expand their choice. But for a large majority of the news sources, we tell you that it's their principal obligation to show both sides of the story because they influence many people People, and they coerce a lot of them if they don't show both sides, right? Their response to this was also to mitigate, saying that's already moderate. But if it's already moderate, then the harms about why you get more polarization simply don't stand, because people probably want to see moderate viewpoints on both sides of the house. That point is out of this debate. The importance of this principle is, as we gave you a lot of reasons why choice mattered, they tried to like flush it out by saying choice was never explained, but actually we did explain it to you a lot. We told you why it's a function of self-identity, what helps with discourse, and what helps with trust in the government in and of itself, right? Because like they said, if choice really matters and people have trust in the government, then they're more likely to be themselves and to identify by themselves in the political spectrum and make that legitimate viewpoint. Secondly, then on the question of quality news point, this guy, they had a few like minor holes in their argument about poking holes, but none of them were actually proved, right? And we rebutted them, they completely dropped them. Like for the first point about how funding doesn't decrease, these are large multinational corporations, guys. They're not going to be like, even if they have a loss in ad revenue, they're probably still going to be funding and up and running, even if they, even if people lose them on our house. But secondly, there are existing incentives to show news of national importance. So things don't disappear, right? And uh, importantly, then we flipped their point about how there's a, how people have to represent on the same things and why that leads to a drive of diversity. When you you can no longer differentiate themselves on different viewpoints on an issue. You find more issues to represent in and of itself, so you get more representation. They never responded to this claim as well. So we flipped this claim on why you report on less things. Lastly, then, quality news about polarization. This was a 30-second extension. I find it obvious like that they tried to blow it up and, and whip, but it doesn't actually work, right? We told you how radicals get worse naturally on your styles due to existing incentives and structural issues within the system. But secondly, we told you why people still opt into these large news stories because of quality, because of legitimacy, other things that they never responded to as well. But thirdly, we told you that even if news is already moderate, then the extremes probably won't be that large of a thing, right? And lastly, about their point about how some views don't get to be represented. I find this very underexplained. We told you why exactly. These views, if they were so problematic, wouldn't be explained in the first side. But even if they are, that helps to engage in discussion and debate and actually is probably going to be more fostering to actual representation and catering towards policies and engagement and rebuttal in and of itself. I want to point out that at the end of this day, we have so proved our principle of why you have an obligation to show people different parts of the spectrum and give them a choice. If you force them into a corner and force them to believing something, you have the, you have the option to give them another chance, another point, another point of what they can believe in, not to force them into one. For all these reasons, we're very proud to propose. Okay, amazing. Thanks so much, everybody, for what was Adrian Ibrahim. Stop recording.